<coughs> Hello again everybody, I must be honest with you, sorry about that. I might have practiced with these saying good mornings and hellos and I don't quite know exactly everything that I'm supposed to be doing. I must congratulate Alice this morning who is the director of the show for having the single most enthusiastic countdown I've ever had in my life. <laughs> well done Alice. <laughs> We are actually on the on the uh, on the pursuit of some or in the pursuit of some lions. I'm hoping that the Angama pride with all those cubs are in this in these bushes in front of us here. And um, although I'd like to say that they're in their usual place, that is not too far from the truth. These lions are very predictable in where they're going to be in the morning, <coughs> and I'm hoping that they're going to be in the same place. <coughs> and. Um, the reason why I think that we're going to get lucky is that in front of us are a collection of safari cars. Now the, the reserve, the Mara Triangle Reserve, opens up its gates at 6.30 in the morning. And, um, and there's this procession of cars that wait at the gate there from all these safari operators that live outside of the reserve. Now, of course, we also live outside of the reserve. We live on the border. Uh, our place is in that valley there. So that is where Alice is sitting right now. That on the left, the tall hill, that's Angama Mara, one of the most beautiful lodges that are on the edge of the reserve. And then in the head of that valley is where our final control is and where our, our room is. That shiny silver thing right at the top, that is our final control. And anyway, we, uh, we live also on the boundary of the park. And uh, I don't know how, we get into the reserve at 6.30, but by the time we're on to the valley floor here, there must be a couple of dozen cars already in position in these, uh, in these sightings. And uh, of course they're all in contact with one another, or we are all in contact with one another. And uh, I sort of just follow around clumps of people really. Last night it was a blustery evening. We had a lot of wind up until about 11 o'clock and then the wind died down and this morning I woke up to a light drizzle. It's been drizzling for a bit. Um, <clears throat> Scott Dyson was out for most of the evening. I was getting messages from him until easily 2 o'clock this morning. So he was out last night. I'm not yet sure what he was busy doing last night. I haven't uh, managed to get that update yet this morning. Um, all my fault obviously. I didn't ask the right questions while I was checking oils and making sure the roof didn't come off, having a cup of coffee, you know, the usual things that we do in the morning here. Yeah? Alrighty, <clears throat> but enough chit chat, we've got, uh, we've got this collection of cars now in front of us, so what I need to do here is keep our eyes peeled, and I have a feeling that we're probably going to be bumping into some lions in the next couple of seconds. Cars in the Mara do not clump around things like buffalo and elephants, unfortunately, the, the only tend to concentrate on cheetah and on leopard and lion, which I suppose is fair enough. Alright, so let's keep our eyes open and see what we're lucky enough to see over here without driving into this amazing... There's a lion there. Some cubs busy playing with one another and disappearing. All right, so that is a cub that had a piece of meat in its mouth. Let's go forward a little bit more. So quite often they will, they will play with bits and pieces and scraps of food. They look like they're nice and full. Let's see. <coughs> Lots of lion tracks there. Robin, you wanted to know if I've ever seen a lion do a kill live on safari. Um, I've seen many lion kills, uh, Robin. Have I shown one live on drive yet for safari live? Um, there's some more lions in there. But anyway, let's go forward. Um, uh, no, I don't think I have, to be honest with you, Robin. Um, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of these safaris, but 
I'm quite allergic to sitting in these cars and doing these types of drives. drives. <clears throat> I find them fascinating really from a large predator point of view. But what I really enjoy doing is walking around. And there to see, to see kills on foot is fairly rare. We've got a lion, a youngster there. I think what we have got here is a, is a mass collection of cubs. I can see another lion lying there. I think what we've got here is a mass collection of cubs that are all playing with one another in and out of this drainage system while moms catch up on some sleep after a, a hunt last night. So. I'm going to unravel the story here a little bit, I think. Let's get into a position where we can actually show you some of the action that's going on here. Um, and why don't we go and have a look at Taylor's lions while I do that. We've managed to locate the sausage tree pride. Apologies for earlier, we were having some comms problems. Our radio is being attacked by gremlins. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is David. And this is live, this is happening right now. And I look forward to having some chats with you today. So, if you have any questions, hashtag Safari Live. And uh, you can chat to us on the YouTube chat. I'm just gonna swing us around quickly. The cubs are very playful this morning. Aren't you little lions? We'll just keep trying to follow them. Oh, these guys are so great. I really am enjoying them and watching them grow. I look forward to spending the next couple of months with them. We'll just sit here for now and then we'll try and catch up to them again. There we go. There might be a little stalk attack happening on the left. There's our favorite little girl who's a little bit lighter in color compared to her siblings. Plenty of energy today. Belly's nice and full. There were a couple of hyenas that were hanging around, so I think they may have gone in and stolen the scraps of those warthog. I think they took care of that. I'm sure the lionesses would have moved off. There were quite a few of them. Must have been about six or seven running around in the grass, and I don't know if the lionesses would want to try and tackle hy or so many hyenas with just their little cubs around. They'll definitely be fearing for them. Now, I'm a little bit concerned. I'm going to go forward again. And the reason why is because they're heading towards their favorite hill, which is not really too good for us. But it's, it makes for a very good resting spot. There's nice trees for shelter, nice and cool things to play on for the little ones. Now, as we drive and we get another position of the youngsters, Paul, you're wondering how old are the cubs? It's hard to say, but the two youngest cubs, the two smallest ones, must be about uh, just less than six months or so. And the others are just over six months, like maybe between six and ten months, somewhere around there. Oh, they are playing. I'm going to try and get a spot quickly for us to watch them. But I'll try to get as far in front of them as I can so we don't have to keep watching them disappear. That's normally the best way to do it with these sightings. Just watching the road as I drive so I don't hit any mounds. Okay, I'll turn now. This should be good. We can have them walk past us. They're very relaxed around the cars. They don't seem to mind us. Not one little bit. Okay, now we just got to wait to see where they're going to come up. I'm just do this, David, and then we can get them coming past us for a little while. Oh my goodness, they're racing around. I don't even know where to look with these youngsters. Those are the adults. They're quite calm and relaxed this morning. They're just scouting out the area. And it's important that when they are moving around that the lionesses are in the front because they know where they've come from. They know what danger lies behind them. Behind them, sorry. And by walking up in front, they can scan and see if there's anything perhaps laying in the grass or sitting up on a termite mound. All those types of things. It can be a bit dangerous if the little ones run up. And we see it often with zebra. And we see zebra do it for an entirely different reason. They're worried about things like lions that would potentially eat them. The stallion takes his time surveying the area before he actually heads down to the water. And these lionesses look like they're taking it easy and also taking it just one step at a time. But they're the other cubs. They're going to come around now. You can see that they're racing and jumping on one another it's always good to see them playing about. And we know how important it is for lions to play. 
you know, our cats and dogs at home, they love to play around when they're young too. It's their favourite thing. But they've sort of lost their hunting skills. They don't, there's no need for them to hunt like the big cats out in wild Africa need to be able to. So that helps develop muscles. It helps them, of course, strengthen and... And, uh, sorry, I'm trying to concentrate, you know, let me listen to this question. Can I have the name again, please? Sir Jake, there we go. We were wondering, I'll get back to my other comment. Why do lions like drainage lines so much? Um, it's a good spot out here, good spot to rest. It's often nice and cool. There's normally trees growing around it. There's, there obviously are a couple of Balanites trees and a, a few others scattered in and amongst the open plains. But sometimes it's nice to just sit on the drainage. Often There's often termite mounds around there which supply very good vantage points. But um, we see it in South Africa as well. They do the same thing. And in the drier seasons, which it is here, believe it or not, even though the grass is fairly green, it's, the animals will go and feed along those drainage lines. So in South Africa, we know that the bulk of the animals move into that area, and that's where they will feed. And so the predators start lurking about and around there too. I haven't really noticed it too much up here, the animals hanging around the drainage lines. I suppose the browsers, it's um, more applicable because there's a variety of trees for them to choose from and shrubs. However, the grazers, I suppose the, gra the grass is a lot greener along the drainage lines too. There's obviously more water that's prominent in these areas. You might be able to hear some hammering. It could be quite faint in the distance. It's not a woodpecker. It is a breakfast stop that is being set up. So I, I, I assume that some guests are out on a hot air balloon safari. And when they come back, they'll be having breakfast here. And these lions are not hanging around there getting out of this area. They're, I think they're wondering, are we going to be for breakfast? No, I'm only teasing. Off they go, meow, chasing each other. But you can see the size difference between the youngest cubs and the oldest cubs. Let me reverse quickly. Jump back behind them again. No. Oh. Sorry, girl, I know I'm like an octopus ejecting ink from the exhaust. <laughs> Dory, you've said that you think that the pale cub looks like she's going to be massive. I think she's going to be a keen huntress one of these days. She's forever stalking. She's always chasing her siblings around. See how she's waiting for her next target behind a shrub? Are you going to make a pounce? Yes, there she is. She was too. Not a big successful pounce though, just really slapping one of her siblings around. Here you go. Go for the ankles. <laughs> That's a good tactic, especially if you're catching younger prey. Ankle tap is not really used by lions so much, but by cheetah. It's one of the ways that they get their prey to fall down. Here we go. She spotted a lurker at the back. And she's going to go down in the grass. Let's see what's going to happen here. Are you going to pounce? Completely disappeared in the grass. Wee! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that wasn't a very good one. She's still learning that. Oh, aren't they absolutely precious? This is my favorite thing to watch is when these lions play like that and her older brother, well, not older brother, these two are the same age. But so one girl, one boy. Very sweet. Is it a boy? Is it other one? Yeah, I think the other one is a little boy. Yes. Now, yeah, as you're wondering about um, if lions and cheetah ever eat hyenas, well, not typically. However, I have watched a documentary where there was a male lion that was exceptionally injured and he was an old boy. He'd been kicked out of the pride and the territory that he once drained in and unfortunately those males that took over, they really hurt him. Can't exactly remember what was wrong with him. And he came across a sleeping hyena at night and actually ended up killing the hyena and eating it because he was so weak. He was he did it out of desperation, which was very, very, of course, uh, unusual. We don't see it too often out here, but again, if an animal is starving to death and it needs something to eat, it's going to eat whatever it can get. So we can't say no, but it's not very common. I've never seen it. I've even just seen where lions kill jackals and they don't eat it. They just kill them and then sort of leave them. And I was telling you the story of the Mapojos, how well, I heard stories that they would leave lines of hyenas on the road when they first came into this area, um, not this area, in the Sabi Sand and took over. 
Uh, they caused a lot of destruction. They killed lots of lions, and then, of course, they killed lots of hyena too. A cheetah, however, I don't think would feast upon another predator again, unless it's out of pure desperation. No, lions, don't, don't do what I said you mustn't do. No, yes, yeah, don't do that, please. Good, no, they're going up the hill. That's not great for us. You can see they're on their way. They're marching in there. Maybe they feel a little bit uncomfortable with the breakfast stop. And perhaps they just will feel a little bit safer up there in and amongst the trees. But you can see how easily they stand out. Look at that. Very, very white against the green grass. And that's what we use to try and spot these animals. Is that's how we spot them from a distance. Is that you just hope that they're not lying in very tall golden grass. But in fact lying out in the shorter grass. And then you are able to spot them quite easily. It'll take you a couple of days for your eyes to sort of settle in and start spotting things so far away. Obviously in the Sabi sand, there's no ways we can spot uh, animals at the distances we do here. And that's just because it's a completely different vegetation type and, and it's very, very dense there. So there we have to track. So it's amazing how two different areas you rely on different skills. Here we rely on our eyesight, also sound plays a huge part on it. So whether it's actually spotting the predator or spotting uh, raptors, hanging around in an area, or if it's hearing a lion roar, or hyenas giggling and laughing, you know, because they're in distress, whatever it may be. And then in the sands, we have to use our tracking skills really well. And then, of course, we rely on you quite a bit when you listen to the lions roaring from the dam cam, or if you've seen something there. Now, Vila, you've asked if I'm enjoying my time here in the Mara most certainly. It's absolutely beautiful out here. I, I don't really have too many words to describe the beauty of Kenya. It's unbelievable. And I suppose it isn't just the wildlife and the scenery. The people that live in Kenya too are just so friendly. Kenyans are lovely. They seem to be so peaceful. Uh, it's been a, just a great experience all around. And the food's not too bad either. Though um, We've try, tried some of the local cuisine. It's interesting, different. But you, but we're very lucky. We've got some fantastic chefs that, you know, cook up the most amazing meals constantly. So it's, it's a little bit of everything, Vila, not just about the wildlife for me. But uh, we'll sit here for as long as we can see these lions, and hopefully they don't disappear too soon because I'm enjoying watching them, especially watching the cubs play. I'm going to send you back across to Steph, and hopefully he's got a better view of his cats. We definitely do have a better view of these cats. Isn't this wonderful here where we are? And a rare treat, the large male or pride male is with his cubs, which is, uh, which is not unusual, but I mean, it is, it is, they get quite irritated by the boisterousness of cubs. And so quite often what you, uh, what you get is a grumpy male with a bunch of cubs hanging off of him. And eventually one of them gets a hiding. And, uh, and so they separate out and what we've got now is we've got a whole bunch of ages, different ages here with dad and uh, although he may, not, he may not be the father of all of these cubs, he definitely will be part of the coalition that is the father of these cubs. If it wasn't the fact he'd be killing all of these cubs, the male lions that are, that, uh, are unrelated to the cubs do not tolerate them at all. These cubs are moving off and the reason for that is that a big female who's in these bushes here has, has, uh, has started to call the cubs and they react to that sound. I think what we're going to do is just turn the car around and uh, see if we can follow these youngsters. They're going to come out onto the road and I think they're probably going to disappear. fairly quickly. So we got lions everywhere. Of course, this particular pride, the Angama pride, has gone up to a massive amount of lions. And they're all busy standing over here and all going to have a game with one another and I think we're in prime position to actually see that. I'm just busy getting us into a, into a better spot.
Madeline, you wanted to know if there's a limit to the amount of vehicles that are allowed in the Mara sighting. There is actually a limit. Uh, there shouldn't be more than five vehicles that are stationary in, in, a, in a sighting. It does, however, go a little bit more than that. And in theory, I don't actually have a problem with it, to be honest. I think that, you know, these sightings, especially in an open place like this, can handle lots of cars. Um, it just depends on how, how the cars are positioned, are cubs being separated from mothers. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that you've got to ask. It's, it, there's no hard and fast rule. Every sighting is different, uh, every condition is different, and it, 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 is, it is basically, it comes down to, uh, it comes down to the cars in the sighting, in my opinion. Here come the youngest cubs now. These are the ones that we saw just initially. Um, playing in that deep drainage line. I think they were left behind. There are a lot of cubs here. Those are the youngest ones that we're watching coming across there now. Around about Earth lifetime, we saw them. They were just a couple of days old at that particular stage. And uh, that was on the 10th of July. And it was uh, around about then that these cubs were born. Gary, you've asked how long it would take them to reach adulthood. Um, at about a year and a half, about at nine months old, lions are starting. Like lions from all ages look scruffy. Nine to about nine months to about fifteen months old, sixteen months old, lions all of a sudden come into their own. And females will take an active part in the hunting. Male lions would are big enough and heavy enough to. Uh, to squabble and scrap over meals um, and uh, and from about two years old I would say that as you, they, they, they're still sub adult to two years old two and a half to three years old they're adults um, but from about two and a half years old I would say that females are a very productive uh, beneficial part of the pride um, whereas males are starting to become big and their manes are starting to come out and then from about two and a half three years old. Um, we've got some lions having a game over there, but I don't think we can see them. They're going to come this way though. Um, from about two and a half, three years old, male, the mothers of males will come into estrus again, and these males will start to react to their mom's estrus. That will then in turn elicit an aggressive response from the pride male who will kick them out. Um, along with their moms and they become then nomadic until they're old enough to take over a pride which happens at around about five to seven years old look here in front of us there we've got one lion stalking a brother over there so that's typical play behavior and you'll see now they're going to ambush one of their litter mates <laughs> you notice how they use cover even from a young age already and they're going to come bounding out of there now You'll see something's going to spark and an, an, a charge. Big game at the moment. These bushes provide a fantastic playground for these lions, and uh, and also a never-ending series of hiding places should the need arise. I don't know what would come and tackle these lions given the fact that there's a big pride male here and all the mothers. That's a lovely picture. I didn't do it. Do you want to know if there's a plant here that these cats react to, like catnip in a domestic uh, cat? Um, that's actually quite a good question. Um, not that I've seen, to be quite honest with you. However, I've, I, for some reason, I have a memory in my mind of uh, of of lions reacting to a specific plant. I, I can't, for the life of me, remember what it is now, catnip. To be honest with you, but I want to say no because I've never seen it before with my own eyes. But in the same breath, I have a memory surfacing in my very wholly, admittedly, memory that uh, that lions do react to a specific plant. Um, why don't I throw that up into the air for everyone watching today and would you mind helping me jog my memory and see if there is a plant that lions react to similar to catnip 
Of course, you can send those answers through to that hashtag Safari Live, and I'll share it with everybody as soon as I get some feedback. If there's no feedback, not to worry. It might just be some fragment of a of an imagination that I had, rather than as a memory. <laughs> Get these youngsters playing there. That's a young male. That's really cool. There's some more having a game there. Siberia, you've suggested that it like wild lavender. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that you you're talking about the lipia species of of plants, which we do find here and at Juma. Um, I've never seen lions react to lipia at all. Um, you see them sometimes rolling in lipia, but I don't know if it's if it's it, there's no joy in it. it. It just looks like they're rolling in it because of whatever, like they roll in grass or in dung of animals. Um, See, what they're doing there is investigating a hole. And that is a very, that, see they're digging inside there, that is a very good skill to learn because warthog and porcupine do live in holes and lion will quite often dig out warthog, porcupine and even aardvark. And what they're doing there is they're practicing digging out of a hole. I don't know what's in there. They might, you might find that there's something in there, perhaps a civet or a mongoose or something. It doesn't look like they are, but they're definitely digging. And now quite often we talk about lions digging stuff out because we see the tracks at termite mounds in the Sabi sands, but we don't often see that behavior. And there you can watch that behavior. One lion at the entrance, another one digging. And what they try and do is create a panic in whatever's inside there. And as soon as it comes out, they'll catch it. There must be something in there that's getting their attention. Zach, they, you've just made the comment that they're such investigators. Absolutely, lions are very inquisitive and it changes. They're almost schizophrenic in their way of, uh, in, their, in, their, in their approach to, to investigating things. In the daytime, they can be quite timid lions, especially in an area that don't see people very often. But at night time they go through a transformation and even the most timid lion in the day will turn into a very inquisitive cat at night time. It's almost like they become super bold and the night gives them a, um, a brashness almost. It's not uncommon for lions to walk straight into a camp at night time, into a kitchen, through laundry, or hunt in gardens, walk between tents, but you won't get that during the day at all. Um, it's different to hyena and hippo and buffalo who will quite often just walk straight through a camp day or night, they don't care at all. But lions go through this transformation and what you're seeing there now is a sort of, it's coolish this morning, they have all got a bit of meat in their bellies, you can see that it looks like they've all had a air pipe stuck into their mouths and you can see their bellies have got a bit of meat in so mom, moms did a good job last night of keeping them full and so they've got a little bit of excess energy and they've got a little bit of you know excess capacity for playing this morning I think is what we what we privileged enough to see I'm gonna s reposition here slightly so that we can see those cute little teddy bears and uh, and while we do so why don't we go over to Taylor's lions and see what they're busy doing hiding away from us, but almost hiding away. The cubs have now gone exploring in this little foresty grove that's up here on all these rocks. And you'll see here some elephants breaking branches. I think they might be on top of the hill, so hopefully they don't go too close to those elephants. We know how curious those cubs are and they don't seem to listen very well, especially to the adults. And unfortunately, Nature is so cruel out here. If you're not going to listen to the adults who have got m a lot of experience with uh, dealings with elephants and hyenas and other lions and leopards and you name it, you're going to find yourself short. Just like uh, I was very nervous for that young male cub that went charging after the buffalo lo last night. I thought that was very, very silly. That could have gone wrong very quickly for that lion cub. But of course they're excited, they're young, they're full of beans, they want to play around, they want to chase things, they want to just be like their moms. But not yet, they're still too young. But at least the older lioness with the tattered ears, oh, big yawn, 
she's still out and about, which is quite nice. But uh, with those yawns, I wonder if she isn't going to perhaps get up and go and join her pride mate just up on the rocks. It's a really nice spot here, and I think it's a perfect home for lions. I think if I was a lion, this would be a, a great area. Like I was saying, it's a big hill, there's rocks, you know, there's trees, there's thick vegetation around, so you can hide away. And then, of course, you can also see what's down below you. And we know how when the big herds of animals arrive here, they typically go towards the escarpment at night and then go back out during the day. He's coming right past the car. Now, Michael, an interesting question from you. Oh. <laughs> so I was going to duck and I thought, no, you caught me red-handed there. Um, so the question basically is, because of the high density of lions in this area, does it take a little bit longer for young males to uh, take over a territory? I think I have not been here long enough to be able to comment on that just because I haven't got much experience at all. I've only been here for two weeks now. Um, but I would imagine it would be exceptionally difficult, Michael. You're quite right. Like I've never, never seen lionesses marking territories before, and I don't think we'll ever get to the point in South Africa where we'll see it. Unfortunately, our popula populations of lions are not fantastic. Um, I mean, they're, they're good. They're definitely good. But... Um, they really move around quite a bit, these young males, and it'll be interesting I think the more time we spend in the Mara. And so hopefully, if you give me a year, I'll be able to answer that for you. So I can just watch some of these boys grow up. But after seeing all the big males here and there, and then the youngsters in between, I can imagine that confrontations must happen on a regular basis. But Steph, however, has got bundles of joy quite close to the car, so I won't hold you away from him. We definitely have. We've uh, repositioned ourselves and as luck would have it, patience pays off and these tiny cubs have walked right up to the car. They're lying six feet or so from the front of the car and are having a game with one another. You can see how close they are. And it's always special to spend close proximity to cubs if you can because it just shows the trust. Moms would never allow... Look at that little... Awesome. Having a full-on game of catch with one another this early in the morning. Now why it's awesome, the significance of it is the fact that we're a different species allowed to view these animals at that type of proximity without the mother lion getting upset whatsoever. And that's important because it allows us to share these lions' lives with you and other tourists in the area, generate an income for these parks. And the fact that these lions are not killing people, and killing cows, and in constant sort of contact in an aggressive manner with, uh, with the local environment is important because it gives a reason for, for these animals to be conserved. Um, there are less than 20,000 lions left in the wild, in the world. And just to give you an example of that, or to put it into context, there's more white rhinoceros in just the Kruger National Park than there are lions left in the wild in Africa. So if that doesn't put into stark focus uh, the fact that lions are in a, are in a very precarious position from... Um, they, 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 there's a risk that they disappear out of wild places completely in the next couple of years. And what was very special about that sighting with these cubs right in front of the car like that was that we are able to share their lives, give them, we're able to repeat it again, and it was very special to do. And that has a value to it. Alice tells me that uh, all of you have had your hearts stolen by these cubs. Absolutely. These little cubs have a way of endearing themselves to a person with their play and their, just their general attitude to life. I must agree with you. It definitely smooths away any frustrations or lingering anger or whatever the case is that you 
entered into the safari with. Always nice to see. Those are two slightly older cubs that have been left behind and I think they're going to come back this way now. Um, Alice, would you mind just repeating our viewer's name again? I got the question, but the name I didn't. Yes. Uh, yes, you... Yes, you've just asked uh, what's the maximum distance that a cub will stray from a mom. Uh, yes, that's a, it's a nice question that ultimately there is no distance. Uh, the reason for that is that um, mother lions will quite often leave their cubs for extended periods of time and walk away to go and hunt. And it can take them away for days even. And um, here's a bit of dinner last night. I think that was the cub we saw carrying whatever it was that they killed. Um, so ultimately that distance is, is infinity, um, but what's the maximum distance a cub will on its own walk away from its mom, not be left behind, I suppose is the, is the actual question there. Not very far is my answer. I would say probably a maximum that I've seen, two or three hundred yards, is being stalked now, and I got you, and then got stuck in the bush. <laughs> Um, two or three hundred yards, yes, is the maximum distance I've seen a cub walk away from its mother. But a mother walking away from its cub is infinity. Well, within reason, obviously. Infinity within the pride's, in the, within the pride lands, so within the boundaries of that pride's territory. It's not uncommon for lions to hold prizes like this. Um, if you haven't seen it before, you will in, in time to come, that lions fight amongst one another, or they squabble rather than fight amongst one another at kills. And quite often that results in bits and pieces of the kill being ripped off and then taken away. And, uh, and in, this, in this particular case, I think what happened was the, the dinner was finished. This may have been ripped off in the melee of the feeding frenzy. And this cub has just picked it up and is now enjoying a tasty morsel. And quite often you see cubs walking around with bones and horns and skulls and legs in their, in their mouths for, you know, a couple of hours at a time, nibbling off the titbits. Just Jules, when do the cubs seriously start hunting is a question you've just asked. Um, Females start hunting before males, and they will, they will, even from now, the cubs watch their mothers intently. Um, and they'll start to, to practice hunting, they'll start to ruin more hunts than what, they actually, uh, than what they actually help with, from about nine months old until about a year and a half. And then females, lioness, from about a year and a half, start to actively play a part in pincer movements and in strategizing hunting. And from about a year and a half, I say that they become uh, beneficial to the hunt, beneficial to the pride. They're actually lending their weight and their muscle and their experience and helping bring down prey. Male lions, although bigger uh, earlier, don't take the same sort of interest. They, they all watch, they're all learning. But male lions quite often just use their size to like, they'll just hang around at the back and wait for mom and sisters to provide a meal and then go and jump in and take the meal. Um, male lions though do go through a period where they're nomadic. So from about a year and a half to two years old to when they're five, male lions scavenge what they can. They hunt and kill what they can and take what they can when they can do it. Um, and in that time, male lions become very good hunters as well. So I say for, from about a year and a half to two years old for a female lion, and from about two and a half years to about three years for a male lion, um, they will start to, to hunt. And, um, you know, I consider them sub-adults, albeit closer to the adult rather than the sub-part. <laughs> right, let's go back and see what other lions we can see. These ones have gone down into this ditch here. have left us with nothing but grass to look at. We've got 
for it a bit. There all the cubs lying with one another again. And they do that because the sun is getting higher now. Moms are starting to relax and to fall asleep. And just the same as uh, human children do, as soon as the energy starts to, to decrease, so their energy starts to decrease. And I have no doubt that given another couple of minutes, these cubs are going to be in a little warm ball with one another and uh, and will be fast asleep with mom. These ones here are still investigating this hole. There must be something inside there. I don't think it's big and dangerous and scary, otherwise these cubs wouldn't be there. But I definitely think there's probably a mongoose or a civet or even a porcupine inside there. Ah, Elizabeth, are these cubs already establishing dominance amongst themselves? Absolutely. Um, the males from, from tiny cubs, from younger than what these ones are, are, have already sorted out a who is the bold one, who is the brave one, who is the timid one, who's in the front, who's at the back already. And that will only increase as they get older. Um, to a point that when males leave and form their coalitions, that they already know exactly as human brothers do, who's stronger, who's bolder, who's timid. And although they all form a fun of, uh, uh, play a part in the coalition, and they all will rally to one another's aid, they'll all help hunt, they definitely will have their personalities already starting to establish from now. Females, they do not uh, have a hierarchy amongst themselves. Females just help one another. They bond with, other, with one another. It's almost say take out the ego um, in females across species and, uh, and you have a similar thing where females just basically rally together. They provide food, they provide shelter for the cubs, they provide support for one another by um, lactating each other's cubs if needs be. Um, they just strengthen bonds between each other rather than try and figure out who's got the biggest mane. Wow, that's a nice picture with those trees in the background. That is a very special view. Awesome. Well done, Craig. That's lovely. That is just a quintessentially East Africa and the Mara flat-topped, or not really flat-topped trees, but flat-bottomed trees from the grazing pressure of giraffe with lion in the foreground. Awesome. Screenshot, please, everybody. That is just a lovely, lovely view of this morning. Misty, hazy morning. Blue skies, a little bit of wind blowing. Smell of grass and camphor on the air. Really nice. Righty. Um, we're going to be moving on from these lines, I think, and finding something else to keep us interested with the day. And in the meantime, why don't we send you over to, uh, to Taylor. She's moved off from her lines as well. We didn't move off of our lines on purpose. They decided to leave us and go and race for the day under the shade of some trees. But we've now got something that the lions and wasabi sand definitely prefer to feed on compared to wildebeest and zebra. It's interesting how the animals of the various areas become specialist hunters. And we know at this time of the year, typically the lions in this area in Kenya are going after zebra and wildebeest because they're in abundance and they're all migrating and they're not thinking straight and well, they tend to be a little bit easier to catch. However, I've not seen the lions take down a buffalo here, seen them get chased by the buffalo. We obviously watched that last night. Whereas in the Sabi sand, the lions are incredible how they're able to take down animals much larger than what they are. But normally the buffalo are in abundance compared to the herds of wildebeest and zebra in the Sabi sand. So it only is fitting that they go for something that there's a lot around them. Now, the buffalo, I can't believe that they all look so grumpy out here. You know, you'd think that they'd be happy now that some of the herds have actually moved off. 
There's a cow. She's stopped to have a look at us because they don't have to compete for grass now. They seem to be... I don't know where these buffalo have all come from because there were no buffalo when I first arrived, barring a small herd here and there. And now there are the prominent grazers around with the zebra. And she's giving us an eye out. The big herd, there must be... Let me try and guess here. Maybe three or four hundred buffalo moving around. There's, so they're all around us, all up from coming down from the escarpment, and then some of them have already moved down on the plains. You can probably hear them mooing, making all sorts of interesting sounds. That's a big bull on the left. He's got a, a very, very large splay of horns, very sharp. Now, with buffalo horns, it's actually important that their horns don't twist too much and sort of end up closing the gap between the boss and the tip of the horn because then they become completely useless and it's very difficult to defend yourself. It's actually easier when your splay of horns is slightly wider because then those tips, those very, very sharp tips are exposed and you can use them as a, a deadly weapon. Hello. <laughs> Always staring at us, aren't they? Wow. Now, John, you're wondering, what are the chances of a man walking 100 miles through the Mara and making it out alive? Probably a good chance. The, the scary part would be at night. And I said to you the other day, I would not take any summer money that someone would pay me if they offered it to me and said you have to walk from the Mara River, from the most southern point of the Mara River, all the way back up the escarpment towards Angama Camp. Never. The amount of hippos, the amount of buffalo, never mind the lions and the big clans of hyena, which are really, really, really curious out here. I wouldn't put it past a clan of hyenas to snatch up a person. So I don't know. I, you know, there obviously are lots of people that do move around in these areas. There's no fences and things. And the Maasai seem to be the bravest of brave people that I've ever come across. They, I've yet to see a Maasai or see fear in a mass eye, sorry. So it's uh, it's quite amazing. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe if they had the relevant bush experience, John, then they could quite easily make it. I wouldn't move at night if, if, if that was me. I'd just move during daylight, and I'd probably spend some of my time up on a rocky outcrop or in a good sort of safe spot uh, where, I th where I'd think that, um, well, hippos couldn't get me, buffalo couldn't get me and also be an unlikely spot to find predators. I try and keep away from everything out, yeah? But the lions will have the same response as the, the lions in South Africa to humans on foot during the day. Of course, it's always a gamble at night. That's uh, when they're most excited, most keen. It's when they hunt. So I've had more encounters with lions on foot at night than I have during the day. But again, it was in South Africa, and they watched you. And if you felt like you were a little bit nervous, you could just clap your hands or even just shout, hey, you know, like we do with the elephants, and they'd actually get up and run away from you. I'm sure the lions would do that here. However, I would not want to take a chance. It makes me a little bit nervous. It's very, very, very wild out here. It wouldn't surprise me if there's some animals that have maybe never seen a human on foot before. That's definitely a possibility. But very cool. But let's carry on. Let's see if we can go and find some more predators not raptors well we look for raptors too i think we'll try and do a bit of birding today how does that sound i'd like to brush up on my birds my kenyan birds and add a few more to my list so we'll start searching for either cats or birds steph has not left his lines he's still sitting with them he must really be enjoying that sighting I am actually enjoying these lines, which is rare because I don't really enjoy watching lines, to be quite honest with you. But it's quite, it's quite nice to, uh, to sit here and watch them when they're active. And of course, with the vistas that we've got here today, it's just superb. Now, these cubs have managed to usurp their mother's position on top of this termite mound, which is quite a common thing for lions to do. They'll quite often sit on top of termite mounds and survey their domain. And you can see that these youngsters, all related to each other, have decided that this is the best place for themselves now. And are basically looking over the area that they will inherit one day. For the majority, these cubs are, I think, females with a couple of males in. 
The males will leave one day and will disperse the Angama Pride's genes into the bush and into the rest of the reserve. Over the coming years, the females will inherit this piece of land and it will be them that are the custodians of the Angama Pride territory and of the gene pool. They will decide which males mate with them and hopefully are the strongest and best fathers for their cubs. And in turn, those strong cubs will look after this area generation after generation after generation. Now, Rochelle, you want to know how do male lions prove their worthiness uh, to the females? Basically, it's just dominance. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult concept to, um, to discuss, to be quite honest with you, because dominating a female for mating rights in human culture is considered very bad. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, how do I say this? The, uh, so male lions will, f female lions are attracted to large powerful males. Male lions have to prove to those females that they are the strongest by fighting for amongst one another but also by dominating the female. By forcing the female to submit uh, encourages ovulation um, and although the female will give all the outward signs of ovulating, um, it's called pre-ovulation, uh, pre-estrus, excuse me, not pre-ovulation, and she can basically withhold ovulating for up to a hundred days, um, forcing male lions that are not right up there or not up to standard to really compete for their attention. Uh, but at a point, what will happen is her body will just naturally ovulate. And at that point, um, her body chemistry will say that the strongest male around wins. So basically, it, it comes down to her body, really, her body's reaction to the males. And the stronger the male, the more, the more dominating the male the higher the chance that the, the female ovulates as quickly as possible. And of course, for her, that's the best thing. She doesn't want the males vying for too much attention around her. You know, it's, it's destructive to cubs. And they take a lot of food and they don't add a lot in terms of hunting ability. And so the quicker the ordeal is over and done with, the better. Another lovely view again. So Jake, you want to know, um, is there more female cubs or more male cubs born to a litter? So Jake, that all depends on how many adult females are in the pride. Uh, if there are a lot of adult females in the pride, then more male cubs will be born. If there are fewer adult females in the pride, then more female uh, cubs will be born in a nutshell. Um, the reason for that is that a particular pride area can only sustain a certain amount of adult female lionesses and so to have more female lionesses means more cubs and it obviously means more mouths to feed and it is unsustainable and so as soon as there's a lot of female adult females there'll be more male cubs uh, born into a litter and once they reach about two and a half years of age they then become nomadic and leave and of course take their hungry belly with them um, but the flip side of the coin is that Having lots of adult females means that that pride is successful and of course that means strong genes and of course the pride not only wants to look after its own gene pool but it also wants to spread its genes into other lions as well. Well, let's call it mother nature. And, uh, and of course having male lions with strong genes, uh, mating with lions with other genes in other areas means that lions in general will increase in, in genetic quality and be stronger and more adaptable, more able to cope with what the environment is throwing at them at that particular stage. Of course lions are, lions are threatened, uh, basically extinct uh, in the wild outside of, uh, of national parks and game reserves which makes them very threatened, their population is very threatened. Less than 19,000 lions left in the wild, in the world. 
But in actual fact, they, they are quite adaptable cats. The only reason why that their numbers have dwindled like they have is not environmental pressure, it's human pressure. Um, as more people uh, basically infringe on the edges of these national parks, lions that are nomadic don't have the tongues and fingers and corridors of wilderness areas between villages anymore and so they're moving through villages and that puts them into contact with, uh, with people and with domestic livestock. And of course lions are scary things, you know, when they get, like now on top of this termite mound they're cute and cuddly but a nomadic male lion is a scary thing if it's busy eating your cow which is meant to feed your family. And quite often lions are shot, poisoned, trapped. And this has led, with people exploding in the last 30 years, this has led to a drastic decline in lion numbers over the last 30 years. To a point which I fear our children's children may not see lions in the wild anymore. Do you say you want to know if this is the area where Christian the lion lived? I'll, I'll, I'll be honest here, I don't know who Christian the lion is and I have a feeling I should, be no, I should know who it is. Um, Ah, George Adamson rescued a lion called Christian. And uh, I'm I'm basically getting some information fed to me in my ear by Alice at the moment, who's frantically trying to get me some information. So I am cheating. <laughs> I'll just let you know that. So I have a feeling that this was a lion that was rescued in Harrods, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, and who this gentleman then rehabil rehabilitated and, uh, and then introduced back into the wild again. And the story goes that he was recognized by this lion a couple of years later. Um, it might be, I, th I think it was in East Africa to be honest with you, I don't know exactly where that was done. Um, we're in East Africa at the moment being Kenya. East Africa also comprises uh, Tanzania as well. Um, it may be in either of these countries but generally speaking yes it would be in this area that that would have happened. Perhaps not this exact game reserve but close to this place. Ah, so Anna Marie, you want to know if there if there's a chance that um, that that a lioness with so many lions around that a lioness could mistake um, cubs from another pride, um, or s s could mistake her own cubs for cubs from another pride? If I'm getting it correct, Alice, did I get that question right? Um, no, that is that, that that couldn't happen. Um, the reason for that is that pr prides with cubs this this young um, stick to their core territory, and that is exclusive of lions from another pride or another family. Uh, the boundaries of this core territory are defended to the death um, by a lioness, and they will not tolerate in their core territories. They will not tolerate lions from another from another pride whatsoever, and so. Seeing these lions, we all say that, you know, they quite, every day we find them in this area, but that is because this is the safest area for these cubs to be. These mothers and the pride males will defend the, the, the core territory against other males or marauding males. Uh, these mothers will defend this area from other females because that's how they feed their cubs, basically, and look after their cubs. Um, and the chance of them finding a stray lion or a stray cub in this area is quite small. It's quite simply because by the time another lion comes into this area, it'll either be chased off or killed. Um, and therefore cubs won't be able to get here. Uh, there's no way for that to happen. So no is the easy answer there for that, uh, for that question. Um, and it is simply because the core territories are defended to the death by lion prides.
James, you want to know how does the conservation of lions in the Mara sort of differ or is similar to those in the Sabi Sands? Um, that's a good question, actually. Essentially, there's no difference. Essentially, uh, areas need to be kept safe for lions and people need to be kept out of these areas. On the other side of the coin, lions need to be kept safe from people and so lions need to be kept away from, uh, from, from people and from animals. The difference in the two comes in the fact that in South Africa it's, easily to, it's easy to do. The South African government's wealthy and the national parks are robust and well funded and um, because of, of, of South Africa's economy needing to export meat uh, or having a surplus of meat which they can then export for, for foreign revenue, they've managed to fence off most of the wilderness areas. So the wilderness areas, even the Kruger National Park, is completely fenced. Uh, and that helps keep animals and people separate from one another. Uh, in Kenya, that's not the case. Uh, in Kenya, commercial farming is, is, is poor. And so people are subsistence farmers and therefore there's been no need to fence off reserves. There's no money for it. There's been no need for it from an export meat export point of view. And so lions and people on the fringes of these reserves do interact with one another heavily. And what is quite nice here is, of, of course, the, now the differences between the two become profound and that the Kruger National Park, you know, has a veterinary service and if a lion does so happen to come out, they'll come and dart that lion and then put it back into the reserve and then a fence maintenance team will come and fix the breach uh, in the fence that the lions got out. Here you actually have uh, almost like a military personnel who walk the boundaries of the park and negotiate with people. So they'll chase lions back, they will negotiate if a cow is killed by lions rather than poison or shoot the lion, that these, we, we call them game scouts or ascaris, will negotiate a payment, a reimbursement for that family's cow. They'll do an investigation, was the cow killed in, in, in tribal lands or was the cow killed in the reserve? Uh, if so, how deep into the reserve, and that will affect the reimbursement of the cows. And basically, it's just an education. It's 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 trying to herd lions back into into the wilderness areas and keeping cows away from the boundaries. If cows happen to be killed or livestock happens to be killed, uh, they will negotiate a reimbursement, a fair reimbursement. Um, if people are injured. Or if lions are injured and investigation is had before any action is taken, um, it, it, it's, it's intense. Uh, I, I take my hat off to, to the Mara Triangle's conservation practices, to be honest with you. It, it is not easy. Uh, this game reserve belongs to the Maasai people, who, who, who for the most part don't benefit from it, uh, who need to benefit from it. And so there's this sort of growing growing pressure that you know unless I'm part of this whole thing I need my cows to come into this reserve and of course that'll spell the end of the lions here and so it becomes ever more important that these lions and the revenue that they generate through companies like ours and through all the tourism that we see here um, are sustainable the, the only way that, 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 that we'll save these lions is if the people around the reserve are included into the revenue streams generated by the reserve, frankly. Um, and that's not the case in South Africa. It should be the case in South Africa. I actually think that Kenya will reach an equilibrium between people and animals far quicker than what they will in South Africa. And, and, I'd, and as I said in the opening of this particular point I'm trying to make, uh, they face the same challenges, ultimately. They are the same thing, ultimately. And they will arrive at the same goal, ultimately. Um, but it will be through very different ways. Nice topic there. Very deep conversation that. Something I feel we need to have a lot of apple juice and a roaring fire uh, to actually reach any conclusion with. And of course, I mean, there are lots of scientists and people working on this every day. A very committed team, both in South Africa, South African conservation as well as uh, Kenyan conservation. It's huge challenges. Um, 
And it's a social challenge. It's not a conservation challenge. It's a social challenge, in my opinion. Conservation will be the, the net result of overcoming the social challenges on the boundaries of these reserves. Conservation will happen naturally because of that. All these lions are starting to group back together again. It's quite a chilly morning. I've, I've, you know, I'm still, I'm in a sleeveless jacket to the, to, with a t-shirt, with a t-shirt on, basically. The wind is quite cold this morning. The sun is intense, as you can see. That's what I'm wearing this morning, my jacket. I've been toying with the idea of putting a, a bigger jacket on, but then I'm hot and then I'm cold and the sun shines on me. I probably have a red nose by now already. The sun is busy beating down on this beak that I have sticking out of my face and it will go bright red just now. Um, you can expect much reflection to happen once I start lathering on the sun cream in a couple of minutes. Um, but I don't know what this morning is doing. There's a, there's a chilliness in the air. I don't know if it feels like rain. Craig, what do you think? Is it going to rain just now? No? <laughs> it feels like an, uh, an, an, um, a spring morning or an autumn morning. Oh, sorry, Alice, I think I've ripped out my yep. Excuse me, I've ripped out my earpiece, which means that Alice is frantically trying to get hold of me, but without this being plugged in, that's not going to happen. Let me just plug that in. There we go, Alice. I'm plugged back in. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to send you over to Taylor for an update while this lioness walks to join her sister. Oh, we had a couple of really cool birds to show you, but they flew away. Well, there's some banded mongoose running through the grass now. But we know mongoose are not the slowest creatures out here. They move at one serious speed. There they go, and they're just off to the right, yeah. Behind the termite mine now. Get them all going through the grass. You can just see their little heads popping up every now and then. Oh, there's lots of them. Isn't that a big group? These are incredible creatures to watch. It's a pity that they're so shy, but I don't blame, blame them. I don't blame them for being so shy, especially when you're so small and you're running through the open grass like that. Can you imagine how terrifying it must be that the thought of a martial eagle flying overhead or a crowned eagle and swooping down and snatching you up? That would also make me want to run away and hide all the time, so I don't blame them. I actually had a cool sighting the other day when we went across the river. Uh, we just missed it though. I heard the guinea fowls going ballistic and the crowned eagle had swooped down and smashed. It, it, was, it was incredible. And basically this guinea fowl looked like a pancake. This crowned eagle came down from quite a height at a serious speed and just really, that's the only way to describe it, it just hit this guinea fowl. That was the end of the guinea fowl and then took it off to go and pluck the feathers and start feeding on it and the rest of the guinea fowl actually hung around and were alarming and just showing their displeasure for what had happened but it was honestly incredible I, I you know you don't often get to see the whole the impact and I would love to have seen something like that to see the force uh, because what that guinea fowl looked like afterwards it must have hit it at a great speed and that's typically what raptors will do is how they will try and kill their prey is obviously they've got very big, a lot of them have got uh, massive talons, not all of them. Crowned eagles have got particularly large feet for their size. Uh, they can also crush skulls of small rodents and small mammals quite easily, so that's another technique. But um, I think the most efficient way in terms of energy is actually just to fly and um, try and hit your prey out of a tree or knock them down on the ground, that type of thing. So I'm definitely going to be looking out for them. It really is nice to see crowned eagles again. We used to see them often in the Eastern Cape. We had a pair that was actually nesting below a lodge called a Corsi Lodge in the Euphorbias. It was quite nice. Now, Kathy, you're wondering what other animals out here uh, in the Mara alarm call? Most animals will have an alarm call somewhere or another. Birds all alarm. Uh, of course, the mongoose, they make alarm calls out here. 
um, you will get the impala we know that they're a snort a wildebeest snort too the zebras sort of make a bleating sound of of sorts uh, so pretty much everything out here even a crocodile to an extent will hiss you know a snake will hiss at you uh, the, you know all these different types of things that snake well for instance puff at us will puff at you hence where their name comes from when they are intimidated so not necessarily a alarm call but also a warning call uh, so, so everybody will have a way to sort of say keep keep away from me or hey there's a predator in the area so I think what we're gonna do now it looks it's quite it's quite the sight there's not many animals around unfortunately with the herds of wildebeest moving off I did see a whole of six wildebeest today four adults and two youngsters running around but that's it and so I thought we maybe go back towards the river and see if we can find anything. That side I'd like to try and find some grumpy crocodiles and uh, one, those ones that look bizarre and and then um, what we will probably do is weave back along the Mara River and go and check some areas out. Uh, ye not yesterday, two mornings ago Craig and I went exploring and I think I was telling you about we went to this amazing sort of little pocket right in the eastern corner uh, of, of the triangle along the Mara River. Obviously we can't drive over the other side of the Mara River. Uh, well, we can, but there's no bridges here. So it was so stunning. I wouldn't mind actually showing you that. It's just a completely different type of scenery. It was really pretty and there was lots of birds. I saw woolly neck storks. I saw black-headed herons maybe we can spend some time and watch try and find a black-headed heron that's fairly close to the road and see if they catch anything that was always one of my favorite things to do in the eastern cape of south africa was watch them cats catch mice rats and and snakes and well anything else they can get their sharp beaks on uh, what else could we do today oh, we're just taking it easy i suppose i've been looking at a lot of the flowers that are growing around and I have absolutely no idea what a lot of them are. I thought I saw something that resembled an oxalis which is part of the uh, clover family. The only uh, the real oxalis I'm familiar with is the oxalis semibola which is a flower that we get in the eastern cape and normally is a pinkish color and it's beautiful very tasty as well. They use them in salads so it's almost a little bit tart but sweet at the same time and know how to describe it and I thought I'd seen some of those but I don't know if they if they are so if any of you have seen some flowers or perhaps I know James is very keen on his flowers uh, if any if he's spoken about any of them it'd be really nice to try and figure out what he's got or what he's seen so far and managed to identify I haven't haven't got a flower book I think there's not many books out on the Mara Triangle. There's a few. Who have we got sitting on the tree here? It's, sorry, it's not the greatest light. We're staring back into a glare. It looks like a leopard faced vulture. Are you a leopard faced vulture? Yeah, yes. Especially when you've got a bald head like that. Not the prettiest of the vultures. They're very mean looking. And tucked away. But you can see there that red skin around the back of the head. That's a sort of giveaway. And, and the largest of the vulture species too. All the ones that we see here, they're beautiful birds. Just resting up on a desert date. Wind is starting to pick up now. I think what this uh, vulture has done is it's obviously roosted here for the evening. There's a couple of them on top of these trees and I think they're waiting for the day to warm up, the clouds to sort of burn away and those thermals will then pick up. And then they can go about on an adventure, searching for things to eat. I'm actually peckish this morning. We had dinner way too early last night. Obviously, we told you we had a sort of mid-game drive. <laughs> so, just Jules, you said that the, wild, the wildebeest... Um, well, obviously they've all disappear disappeared and you said that you've missed them and it's quiet without them. Uh, it definitely, well, here we go. Just Jules, here's a wildebeest for you. And however, it's not quite intact, I'm afraid. 
that this is what we're sort of seeing that's left of the wildebeest at the moment is just carcasses scattered all over the plains. I'm hoping that they'll come back. Whether you know, I've, I have heard that the grass is lovely and short and like a golf course in the Serengeti at the moment, and so that's nice. That's lush. All those lovely sprigs of grass. So whether they need to come back here or not, I'm not so sure. But I remember I said to you yesterday that James had said that there were large herds north of the the Mara Conservancy. So maybe they still got to they've still got to come south at some point. And um, hopefully they come through this way. I know a couple of them don't ever leave. They just hang around in the area all year round so that would be quite nice it is very empty but the herds of buffalo definitely are making up for it uh, there's no shortage of them at the moment and the zebra are in abundance too they don't seem to be going anywhere i'm just thinking which road we're going to take i also wouldn't mind checking up on that jackal den it's been a couple of days i just sort of left it maybe we can go past there I'm trying to remember when i last week there and Anna Marie you were actually wondering if I'd seen the jackal pups again I haven't um, I, we've been so busy doing all sorts of other things I completely forgot about no, I didn't really forget about them I just didn't have a chance to veer off my route and then sort of head in that way so maybe we'll go check there we are heading towards the river I think this road actually might take us quite close to where the jackal den is so let's do that let's go check there we're also going to keep an eye out for some birds I really want to show you a yellow throated long claw I love the long claws uh, seen the uh, the other one that I am quite fond of I'll show you if I can find I might have to search for a picture I don't have my massive bird book with me oh no I've got a bird app so I can show you actually so let's keep going I'm, I'm indecisive let's keep going to get to the jackal then because we can stop there and talk about things if the jackal are not around mm. Which way is this road going to take me? Hopefully it doesn't just take me back that way. We want to go down there. But we'll keep heading in the direction of where the jackal den is. I'm going to send you across to Steph, who's still with his beautiful cats. Welcome back. And uh, these cats are definitely starting to do what lions do best, and that is sleep in the middle of the day. And they're starting to move underneath the bushes where the most likely chance of, uh, of getting some shade is and that is exactly what they've done now it's moved off games are finished moms are sleeping cubs are now lying up underneath the shade as much as what they can and I think they're probably going to be spending most of the rest of the day here now the only thing that will move them really is if a herd of zebra or wildebeest or buffalo come through here, or elephant even, uh, or if they run out of shade, uh, which is unlikely with these bushes, these uh, woolly caper bushes provide the most unbelievable shade underneath them. And uh, with the grass so short, I think there's going to be a nice cool breeze blowing today and, and they'll be able to digest whatever zebra or wildebeest or whatever they caught last night uh, in peace for the rest of the day really. And uh, yeah, it gives us a nice time to leave them. We've had a fantastic sighting here this morning. It's going to be exciting to see what else is in this reserve this morning. I've got a plan for the rest of the drive. I want to go and pop my head into, uh, into um, a den site which I found yesterday. And uh, hopefully there's some things in attendance there. So remember to keep on watching. I don't quite know what I'm going to find over there but I'm quite excited to go and see what it is in any case and uh, we're lucky oh, here's a line right next to it I'm gonna go and join brothers and sisters now this cub is still being supplementary fed by its mom and that's why it looks in such good condition but those are some of the older cubs and I can tell you that in a couple of months from now that cub is going to start looking scraggly as it needs to start fending for itself and uh, and the milk stops at about eight months or nine months the milk will stop and it'll start needing to fight its way around carcasses and of course being so small it's not going to get a lot of food and that means that it's going to lose a bit of condition and most cubs between sort of nine months and a year look a bit scraggly but we're going to get a car pull in front of us now there's just a line of cars that want to pass so what's going to happen is they're going to come past so what I want to do is just uh, 
we're just going to let them pass quickly and they're going to come past and uh, lions in the Mara obviously elicit quite a lot of uh, attention and um, we try and limit the amount of off-roading that we do because otherwise roads will just get too wide here and so what happens is these lines of cars as you can see uh, down there are created and from time to time we need to squash past one another and it's all just part of sort of guiding etiquette that we have here amongst ourselves Lux, you want to know why the vehicles are open? It seems dangerous. Um, I would say that the vehicles here are closed. They are open-topped vehicles, of course, and um, they, uh, they are allowed to stand in the top of these open-topped vehicles. I, apart from one or two odd occasions with elephant or lion, I haven't actually seen it have a negative effect on, uh, on these animals at, at all. I think they're pretty used to it, which is quite weird because in the Kruger if you stood up next to a lion quite often they growl and they move off or they charge at the car I think it's just what they've gotten used to here is it dangerous is a question that you've asked um, it's not dangerous well yes it's dangerous is it deadly no it's dangerous because standing up you create the you, you take away from the the general shape that these lions are used to and at close quarters you could actually get yourself into trouble does it happen not as often as what you think it does i think lions are incredibly tolerant of tourists thankfully and you know there's very few instances in africa where you'll hear of a lion jumping into a car or hurting somebody in a tourist car it's it's very rare that you hear of those instances if ever in actual fact i'm trying to think of an instance where we've actually apart from hunting which i mean we can go into at length uh, but we all know what the outcome there is it's a it's an aggressive response based on absolute fear um, the animals do not fear people in these game reserves and it's because people are so super respectful of them and their space and so apart from the odd infringement of that I, no i think it's 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 relatively safe to do Joanne, you want to know if there's going to be bushwalks in the Mara at any time? Um, Joanne, it's unlikely that we'll do bushwalks here. There's no walking inside the reserve, um, per se. And the reason for that is because it's fairly dangerous to walk around here. There's a lot of buffalo, a lot of elephants, lots of lion. The grass is nice and thick. Um, but Apart from the danger aspect, the bigger one is the fact that there's not as much diversity as there is in the park and so you've got an authorization problem because no one else does walks in the park. We've got a problem with it being very dangerous to walk around here and then we've got a diversity problem which the Kruger just sort of trumps on all accounts. So we are unlikely to do, uh, to do walks from here but what we do do here is we follow these characters as often as what we can and that is into the night it is it is with these cars um, following these animals at massive lengths which we cannot do in the Kruger and that's exciting so that's sort of a trump card on this side I'm already seeing some elephants and some buffalo so I think when we get into the front of here it's going to be quite nice just to scan the escarpment and show you what else is around what I do want to do is just uh, get rid of my irritation factor here. I've got someone that's decided that they need to live inside my car. And uh, that's just one of these things that we have to deal with. <laughs> my claustrophobia, it's not anything else, it's just my own claustrophobia. Right, so we've got some elephant and we've got some buffalo that are in front of us here. And I think we'll get a little bit closer before I ask Craig to show you what they look like. This road is going in their direction. It's still fairly chilly, I must be honest with you. Although by chilly I mean it's probably about 22, 23 degrees centigrade. I get cold very easily.
Oh, it's been a lovely day. Ah, my partner in crime, Taylor, this morning has, uh, has said that she wants to go and visit that jackal den that she found. She's also on her way there and uh, I'm sure she's going to want to tell you exactly what it's all about and what she's been up to. So we'll see you in a little bit when we get a better visual of these illies in the front. We'll call you back. I'm trying to find the jackal den and uh, we've come a different way from what I normally did. I normally try and get behind the jackal den and come through and this time we're ahead of the jackal den so we just need to backtrack but we're very far away still. We've got quite a bit of driving to do so I'm going to just keep driving until we get there. Otherwise we'll probably never get there by the time the show ends and I know how disappointed all of you would be but we'll just keep heading along. Very windy. Also that the fact that I'm probably because I'm driving that it's windy. Captain obvious today. <laughs> Please can I have that again? Sorry Alice, it's very difficult to hear you when we're driving. So sorry, sorry, I can't hear the beginning, the move, oh, the movement, I, just, I couldn't hear the movement part. Okay, so the question's from Roshni and it is, does the movement of the buffalo have anything to do with the migration? I think the movement depends on the amount of wildebeest and zebra that are around here. The elephants and wildebeest from, from what I've just seen and also from what the other guides have told me, they don't seem to enjoy those big herds around. There's obviously a lot of competition for food there. So they, it looks like they just head up to the escarpment and move out of the area completely or head into the river lines and once the wildebeest and the bulk of the zebras sort of move out and you can actually start to see the grass again, then everybody comes back and seems to be quite happy. So they don't necessarily follow the masses of migrations. Like in South Africa, it's a little bit different. Obviously, our dry seasons get horrifically dry. I mean, you've seen there's completely bare in the winter months towards uh, the end of August before we get our first rains. It's not very pleasant at all. So there, it's vital that the buffalo follow the rains if they want new green grass, just like the zebra do and the wildebeest do over here. They do the same thing down in South Africa. But there's enough, in my opinion, I think there's enough food to, to sustain the, the buffalo. It might not be the greatest in terms of nutritional value, but there's definitely something that can keep the weight on them. They're starting to look a little bit thin. You know, you start to see a little, a few ribs here and there, but it, it's not anything like what we've seen in in South Africa when uh, for instance when we have really bad droughts and we even just not getting our uh, required rainfall every year is a big problem what is that is that a stick logosaurus logosaurus sneaky logosaurus I thought it was maybe a cat sitting up, but that's not the case today. I'm just trying to concentrate here and see if I remember how to get them. Okay, well, I think we've got to go a little bit further and then we're going to make a left just now. I'm going to send you across to Steph in the meantime, who's managed to get a better view of his elephants. We found a beautiful view of these elephants and they've come down off of the escarpment. They probably spent the night on top of the escarpment in the villages. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, they need to vary their diet with wood, uh, woody species of plants. And at night we're finding these elephants coming up onto the escarpment and eating in the forests. And then during the day coming back to the protection of the, uh, of the reserve. And right now they're busy drinking some water from that is collected in this uh, in this sort of seep section and it's almost they almost came rushing off of this mountain i wonder they, 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 they didn't have a drink then the whole night basically i wonder where they've been it was interesting to know you know the villages start two miles from where we are now and these elephant walk around our tents 
all the time. And look at that. Look at this female here at the back with the one tusk. She's got an enormous tusk. Just one. The other one is broken off. But that is probably the longest tusked female I've ever seen in my life. And see when she comes now out of... Uh, it's very really difficult to see there, that angle, but... That is a ginormous tusked cow. She'll come out into the open now. Once they've just slaked that initial thirst. A lot of these elephant cows have babies at the moment, and youngsters as well. Quite nice to see. She's very uncommon not to see elephants with a, with a baby. Tim, you said it's quite unusual or quite weird to see how they smell the water. They definitely do, Tim. Elephants are picky when it comes down to the quality of the water that they like to drink. They like to drink clean water whenever possible. And quite often you'll see elephants walk up and smell the water first and even brush with the tip of their trunk, lightly brush uh, any debris on the top of the water out um, before drinking. And it's not uncommon for elephant to dig for water even in the presence of, of, uh, of surface water. Um, they, definitely, they definitely enjoy a cool, refreshing but clean drink. And unlike almost every other animal out here who will drink whatever water is available to them. You can see that they've just gone down now. Almost all the elephant now at the moment are busy eating. Alice tells me that there's a lot of you that are so happy to see elephants. It's quite nice. Have a look at this elephant that's kneeling down there. He's obviously decided that it's too deep. <laughs> it's gone down on his knees. <laughs> How weird. This is the first time I've seen an elephant do that. It is quite endearing though. This female with a massive tusk is going to come out the back there now. There she goes. And that is a noteworthy elephant, I must be honest with you. As soon as you can, see if you can snap a screenshot of her. I'll try and get onto the other side of her um, as this um, as the sighting sort of passes us and we'll see if we can get you a nice screenshot of that elephant it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, if she in fact um, has a history in this particular reserve go forward a little bit off-roading zone which means that I can go off-road here let's see if we can get a little bit closer to her and also to her family and see and share a bit more intimacy with them elephant of course are quite nice to spend close proximity to they're different to lions they 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 give you a different feeling see now we're at eye level with this elephant there and her young calf probably no more than two or three months old maybe a little bit more than that Christy you want to know if elephants have a more difficult time finding food in the winter months they absolutely do Christy in the, in the Kruger National Park uh, in South Africa uh, elephant go from eating about 80% grass in the summer to having to eat about 80% woody species of plants in the winter. And of course, you know, having to eat bark and roots and trees and branches, it's more difficult than just shoveling mouthfuls of grass into your face. Ooh, water pouring out of your mouth, delicious. In the Mara, there's no winter. There's a dry season and a wet season. And in the dry season, except for this year, which has had rain almost every single day, um, I'm sure that the elephants will battle as well, to be honest with you. And it's not uncommon to find elephant in those valleys. So behind that Eli now, you can see a wooded valley. Elephants spend most of their evenings in those woody, woody valleys. Um, coming to these marshy areas during the day to eat some grass, 